Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Art Study of You. I am your host, Cameron Gilmore. We have a banger of another interview. Y'all better buckle up. To name, to name, to name. Jenkins <laughs> is on us today. Oh, before before I get into the, the typical questions of, you know, who you are, explain your so forth, I'm going to read this because I need to understand something better. In your book, guys, go out and get this book. The links will be here. You stated this, quote, in March 2010, I was arrested by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and charged with defrauding a financial institution. And in August on the same year, I pled guilty in front of a judge and was sentenced to two years in prison and five years of probation. Penane, what in the heck, what in the heck did you do to land in prison? I, um, I stole some money. So I stole some money. That's what I did. I created a CD, uh, a fraudulent CD in a bank's account. And I went into the bank and I I say, hey, I want to withdraw this money. And they said, OK, let me have your ID. I gave them my ID and they gave me a check for eighty seven thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and eighty six cents. I made the the CD for $88,000, but because I withdrew it early, I got a 14 cent penalty. So that's where that number actually comes from. <laughs> They're like, hey, you know, you get a penalty for withdrawing this. And I was like, well, how much? 14 cents. Don't worry about it. To get started, I need to give a shout out to my biggest sponsor, Warrior Energy Drink. The reason why we partnered together is because we have the same mindset, we have the same drive. We're, we're for the people, we're about the people. Look, Warrior Energy Drink has zero sugar options, and they got water as well. Low calories, great taste, very affordable, no crash, big energy fast, high in B vitamins, awesome, awesome design, culture design, 160 milligrams of caffeine. Other energy drinks have way, way too much, and they're always giving it back to their community. They're paying it forward. Partner with them. Guys, click the link below. Go, go get yourself your own Warrior Energy Drink and go crush today. So you... You, you created a fraudulent CD, go into the bank, get money. Yes. How did you get caught? Because you walked out of the, look guys, you went in to an institution, a federal bank. It's not like you walked in with a gun and did arm robbery. Mm -hmm. You walked in, it, it reminded me, look, if you haven't seen the show, Sean Shake Redemption, the very end of the movie where he goes in and says, I'm going to cash everything, he cashes out. Uh -huh. That's essentially what you did. It is. How did you, how? Like, how did that happen? Well, because the city was never funded, they started doing some research. So they started investigating, like, okay, it was $88,000 CD, but we never got the $88,000 to fund this CD. So who created the CD? Where did the CD come from? And who withdrew this money? So they started investigating, doing all of this research. And because I was tied to everything, like, every, you know, my face, my name, all that good stuff. They just, they, they followed the breadcrumbs and it led right to me. I I'm, I'm, wasn't a very good criminal trying to get away with something <laughs> of that, of that magnitude. I, um, I honestly did it just to see if I could do it. And I did it and then caught, got caught when I did it. So. That's what that uh, was. No, 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 no. You didn't do it. Look, in your book, in your book, we're gonna quote we're gonna quote out this book here. Okay. When the quote in this book you wrote, you say, quote, I did it to see if I could. I didn't need the money. Hell, I didn't even want the money. Right. And I did it and I did what I did by myself. No one else knew what I had done. Correct. And I wanted to keep it like that. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it was like this cat and mouse. Right, this cat and mouse game. Could I do it? Mm -hmm. Could I get away with it to see if you could do something so big, so bold, so outrageous, and not get caught? So, what put you in that state? What put you in that state? Because it's not something you just wake up and go, "Heck, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go commit, uh, I'm gonna go commit financial fraud today." Right. Like, how did you get to that state of mindset of this is what I'm going to do? just to see if I can. Well, being that I, I really didn't need the money, I, I had a decent job, didn't really need the, the extra money. It was just, 
And I did it over time. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I wonder if I could do this. So that, that wonder sat with me for a little bit. And then I said, I think I can do this. That sat with me for a little bit longer. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it and see. So when I created the CD, I watched it. I watched it for maybe a week or so to see if anyone would catch the mistake and no one caught the mistake. So then my thought process went to, I wonder if I can go and get this money. And that thought sat with me for a little bit. And then I said, I'm going to see if I can get this money. And that is what, like that thought process, just to, let me, let me see. In and out, in and out. And when I got the money, I was like, I actually got the money. Huh. <laughs> now what? Like, now what? Now what do I do? So I literally, you know, paid off a car, gave my best friend some money, you know, gave my mom a little bit of money, and then just put the, bought up some clothes and some shoes and just put the money, the rest of the money up. So it wasn't, you're right. I didn't wake up and was like, you know what? I think I'm going to steal $88,000 today. <laughs> it was like, literally, I wonder if I can. And that wonder got the best of me. Mm. Mm. Guys, you need to go back. If you're, if you're listening to this on you know, Spotify or Apple, go, you need to go listen to that part on YouTube. You can just watch the gears in Tanae's mind. You can just watch her relive, right? Relive that thought process of, I thought, I, I wonder if, I wonder if. It started there and it just it just kept festering. It kept festering. It kept festering. And then it changed to a thought. Then it changed to an action. Yes. Then, it, then the action changed to a result. Mm -hmm. A result that puts you in prison for, yeah. for two years. It's not like you went out and did armed robbery. It, before I ask this next question, explain to everybody, who, who, people who don't know, explain what a CD is for, for us ignorant people, you know, me being one of them. What is a CD and how did you create it? All right. So the CD basically is like a savings, like a bond or a stock that the bank has. So it accrues interest over time when you deposit money into it. And if you like, you'll have a 1% CD or a 2% CD and you can have a CD for a, a period of time. So five years, 10 years, 20 years. And so when I created the CD, I believe I created the CD for just one year. So it would have earned like 1% over that one year. And what was the other part of that question? So, so that's what the CD is. It's just like, you know, you, people can dump money in, they earn money, and then they, they get that money back. It's like a savings account, so to speak, with a higher interest rate. Just that so happened this savings account had no real tangible money. It had no real tangible money because it was fraudulent. And I, the way I went into the bank system, I actually was working. I was in training. Let's just go ahead and say I was in training <laughs> at the bank. And so they were teaching us the difference between the live system and the training system. And with the live system, if you did anything in the live system, you just had to tell um, your trainer or whatever have you. But we practiced in the dummy system. Mm -hmm. I went over into the live system because that wonder got the best of me to see if I can do it in the live system. And that's how I created the CD because I was being shown basically you know, how to create CDs and what CDs were. So I was learning the ins and the outs of the system. Let me ask this question. Had you, had you stolen anything prior to this? Had you robbed anybody? Have you done any kind of money laundering? Have you, you know, cheat, cheated, you know, robbed Peter to PayPal? Have you done anything major criminal activity prior to this? No not major criminal activity. When I was, I think I was like 14 or 15, I did a petty theft with some basketball cards. But outside of that, not so much. <laughs> Stop, guys, get, listen listen to what she's saying. It, she, she was an upstanding citizen. 
She had a job. She didn't need the money. I was a military, Air Force, all of that good stuff. And yeah, I just, one just thought in my head and it just festered. And I was like, gosh, man, if I would have thought about it a little bit more, then, then I probably still would have done it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is incredible. And the reason why I ask that question is because, you know, you, you, a stigma comes about, right? Mm -hmm. The stigma comes about of, oh, okay, so you went to prison for bank fraud. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, you must, have, you must have had some years of history of, you know, criminal activity. Mm -hmm. Oh, you must have been a bad person, you know, in and out of school. You know, you must have flunked out of something, right? The stigma gets placed upon you. And we're going to touch more about this later on the interview. But I just want us to address this up front because it's not like you had this rap sheet. Right. Of all, you were, you were ever, you were just the average, everyday, ordinary person. What was being a good community, a good human being, mm -hmm. just made a dumb mistake. Dumb. I was a, dumb I was a business, Yeah, I was a business analyst making about sixty a year back in twenty ten. Uh, housing market crashed. I uh, lost my job and went into another job at a bank. And it just was like, yeah, let me see. <laughs> it's, it always goes back to the let me see thing. And yeah. um, it was the worst, best mistake I've ever made in my life. How so? The worst mistake, because of course I was taken away from my family and my friends because I had to go to prison. And I, I literally gave 10 years of my life to the Department of Corrections. But if not for me making that mistake, I would not be helping so many people today. So, ah. yeah, it was like I had to go down that path to get to my purpose. Didn't, yeah, didn't see it then. Like, <laughs> I didn't see it then. You know, this is going to end up good. No, <laughs> that's not what I saw at all when I was sitting in, in prison on this bunk. But um, it turned out to be the best, worst mistake I've ever made. Oh, my gosh. Oh my, not what point as you're sitting in your in your cell mm -hmm. two years in prison, what at what point does it did it dawn on you that your calling in life is bigger than a rap sheet or what will be placed next to your name to name Jenkins felon? Yeah. At what point did you say this cannot be who I am going to be known for the rest of my life? Oh, it wasn't when I was in prison. <laughs> I, nope. didn't, I didn't think that at all while I was in prison. I was going through the motions when I was in prison. I was not living. I was existing. I was mm. merely just uh, walking uh, blindly while I was in prison. I was the GED teacher while I was there which in turn gave me some sense of purpose while I was there. And I did touch a lot of lives and, and helped a lot of women earn their DED. And that, that in itself was the dopest thing that I could have done while I was there. So I knew I was placed in prison for a certain situation or a certain time. And so I, I'm not mad at that. But when I got out of prison, is that? But when I got, I'm sorry. No, you're when good. Out of prison, um, that is when, nope, eight years down the line is when I realized that my purpose was bigger than the pain that I was going through. Mm. In fact, in your boat, in your boat, in your book, I want to read this part in the book because it's absolutely incredible, okay? Quote, mm -hmm. I remember the day that I, I remember the day they released me from prison. I didn't know what I would do with my life, with my newfound freedom. I was scared and anxious. This was my chance. Yes, I had five years of probation ahead of me, but I would play the hand life dealt and make the best of my situation. What then is, would you say, the biggest misconception people have with those that are coming out of prison? That they don't want to do well, that they don't want to do what's right and stay out of prison. Uh, a lot of people 
will say, you know, coming out of prison, oh, you're just going to go back. Even the guards would say, you'll be back. And that's not the case. When we get out of when I'm, I'm going to say 95% of people that get out of prison don't want to go back. The situations and circumstances lead people back to prison. I almost went back to prison at no fault of my own. So the biggest misconception is when individuals get out of prison and they try to do what is right and they try to do well and there's barriers in front of them and then they end up back in prison and it's just a revolving door. It truly is. And a lot of rearrest from people that get out of prison is a technical violation of a probation. It really is. And people don't understand that. Explain that more because I, I'm very, I'm very, before we had, before this, we, we had a, a, a previous conversation mm -hmm. and I'm very ignorant. I, I'll say it point blank. I'm very ignorant to, to what you mean by violation. I understand the violation, but you okay. would think, you know, I hear violations from somebody who got to prison. Like, well, you probably did something you were, you were sold. Don't do this. And you probably did it anyways. And that's what ended you back up into prison. Mm -hmm. So help us. Bring us into that space, please. Bring us into that space of what do you mean by, a lot of times they get back by violation. So everyday things that you do or that you would do, we can get violated for. For instance, I was um, taken to the nearest hospital by ambulance and it happened to be in a different county. And I, I could have gotten vi uh, violated for that because I was not supposed to be out of my county while I was on probation. Another violation is not being able, not, not being able to keep a job. But when you don't have transportation to get to a job, then you can't go to work and then you're fired and then you can get violated and end up back in prison because you couldn't keep a job. You have, um, Say you, you have to take the bus to and from work. Mm -hmm. Something happens on the road. You get home after curfew. That's a violation. But your bus was delayed. So things like that. My grandmother passed away. And yes, I wasn't supposed to be out of the county. But it was an emergency phone call. And my mom was hysteric. I said, Mom, come get me. I'll ride with you. It was across Georgia, Florida lines. And even though it was a family emergency, even though she passed away, I could have gotten violated for that. So it's it's everyday day things that people don't realize or think about. It's just second nature that people on probation and parole can actually get violated for. How? Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. How does that play with the mental aspect? The anxiety must have gone up, right? Yeah. The depression must go up. You can't, you're going to tell me you get injured, call for an ambulance. That ambulance, those of you who don't understand, the you know, ambulance is going to take you wherever mm -hmm. they're de designated to take you to. You could have gone back to prison because you had to call an ambulance to go to a hospital that was outside of your county. Correct. How then does that mental aspect, the anxiety, the depression, how does that play a part? in decision-making right out of the, right out of prison. Cause you're walking on eggshells. You're absolutely walking on eggshells. And when I was released from prison, I had a restitution. So I knew I had to get a job and it's, <laughs> it's not easy to get a job with a living wage when you are a felon. Mm -hmm. I was making $6 and 25 cents an hour after prison as I was making 60,000 before. And I, I say all the time that when we are released from prison, we are not finished with our prison sentence. It's a life sentence because when we come home, we then start serving a second sentence. And that sentence is to live below the poverty line. It really is. Like we struggle and there's so many homeless individuals that are returning citizens because they can't get a job to sustain themselves. So all they can do is live on the street. And if they're living on the street and they're supposed to report, are they 
have an ankle monitor that they can't charge. And this has happened. Have an ankle monitor that they can't charge on their ankle and they can't be found probation violation. So the if you have to walk on eggshells all the time, looking over your shoulder, hoping and praying that you don't do anything wrong or nothing else could go wrong. I was pulled over for a crack windshield. The police, like the, and he, we were at a red light. He was on my right. I was on, um, yeah, he was on my right. The crack was on the left side of my windshield. It was on my driver's side. Mm -hmm. How he saw this, I'm not sure. But he pulls me over and insisted that he search my car because I was on probation at the time. And I had to tell him, I said, I don't do drugs. <laughs> like, okay, I'm on probation. I went for stealing money. Are you going to be looking for money in my car? Because if you find it, please give it to me. Because yeah. I need it right about yeah. now. But think just just things like that. You you can't speak up on certain things or to certain individuals when you're on probation. It, it's so, so paralyzing mm -hmm. is what it is so absolutely the, the depression and anxiety it's the one of the worst feelings because you feel trapped and handicapped at, at, in in some point man man that that hits that hits deep i'm gonna play devil's advocate real quick okay well you did the you did the crime. You did the time. Absolutely, but, but right. But think about how many people, how many how many times have you heard this? Maybe not just you guys. Look, look. Go back. You can go. Look, she's a TEDx speaker. Okay, if you haven't listened to her, go up from this. You probably have never listened. To her, but go back and listen to her TEDx talk. It is impactful. It's moving. You know, then that is her zone of genius. You know that is her calling. Like you listen to that, and you're like. Oh, got you, got you. So I'm gonna play devil's advocate. You do the time, you do the crime, you do the time. And then you hear people, a lot of people say, well, you sh why do you get the same freedoms as we get? We didn't do anything mm -hmm. wrong, but you did. You, should, you shouldn't be able to have the same freedoms and the same joys and the same things that we I have because mm -hmm. I've never committed a crime in my life. You did it, so you should get everything that comes. Help us understand that misconception. You have to this point, and I absolutely love it. But well, how, how can we better understand that partnership and that relationship from those that are coming out of prison that want to do better, that have, have every intent to do better, and those that are like, yeah, yeah, that's your fault, not my fault. Hey everybody, I want to take this quick second here. A lot of you have asked me what journal do I use, my family use. Simple, this journal right here. See, my buddy Craig Smith has spent years and years developing a journal that takes everything that's up in here and puts it on paper so we can be edified and grow. So if you don't know what to write about, which oftentimes happens, he gives you ideas. And if you want power statements, things that say, I am this, he gives you those ideas. Now, if when you look at on one page, it says, this is what I'm accomplished. This is what I am statements. And there's a quote every single day that you get to write on and, and focus on. The second page is write your daily thoughts, get it out of your head, put it on paper to be the best version of yourself. The link's down below. Listen, I get no money for this. It's just, I believe in this journal. I love this journal. It's changed my life, my family's life. And if you want, it'll change your life as well. Imagine being judged on the worst mistake that you have ever made in your life. And then imagine being punished for that mistake for the rest of your life. It could have been drinking while you were a little too tipsy. It could have been running a red light. You know, oh, I just ran a red light. Now that's on you for the rest of your life and we're gonna treat you differently for it. Is it a crime? Yeah, it's a traffic violation. It's a traffic crime. Mm -hmm. So when people say, you know, you, you did the crime due to time, that's exactly what we've done. We did the crime. We went, we completed our sentence. We did our prison time. We did our probation time. So shouldn't it end there? 
Like, and if that is not the case, give us a life sentence. Then we'll understand. Then we're like, well, I have a life sentence. I get it. But if you're going to sentence us to prison, probation, prison, parole, whatever it is, let that be the end of our sentence. Don't continue to punish us if we completed our sentence. I mean, listen, if we all were judged on crimes that we did, mm -hmm. we'd, we'd all be in trouble. Right. We'd all, we'd, you know, it's not, it's not for you or me or anybody in this world to judge what someone does. It's, in fact, I'm going to read this part out of your book because mm -hmm. it, it, it's beautiful segue into it. Quote, envision what your future would be like if you forgave yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you trust yourself? Do you trust in your ability to become a better person? Do you believe everyone deserves another chance? If you answered yes, then forgive yourself. Please take me, please take us in that space. When you wrote that, when you wrote that, what, help us understand where does that come from? Where did that come from deep down inside in the depths of the pit of your belly? Where did that come from that you could write this out and bring such power on to, to words on pages? I did not realize that I was punishing myself for eight years after I got out of prison. I did not realize that I was beating myself over and over again for a mistake that I had made 10 years prior. And I did not realize that I had to forgive myself to get on the other side of that mistake. So when I was thinking about it, I when I when I realized forgiveness was the key to my own um, success, not not forgiveness of others or someone else forgiving me. I needed to actually forgive myself because I was the person that was holding myself accountable so much so more than anybody else in the world. Like everybody else, you know, my friends, my family. You know, oh, yeah, you went to prison a long time ago. But to <laughs> me, I was still in prison. I was still treating myself as if I was putting the handcuffs on myself. And because I was putting the handcuffs on myself, I could not move forward in life. So if I could forgive others so easily, if I can dish out second chances to people that hurt me, why could I dish out a second chance to myself? who hurt myself, you know, to the person I hurt me. Why couldn't I give myself a second chance and forgive myself just like I had done so many others. So in accepting that, that concept and saying, you know what, I'm going to stop beating myself up over something I did so long ago and I'm going to forgive myself and I'm going to move on. And when I did that, my life started to change. It was the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> oh, I'm about to scream out of my mind because, oh my gosh. Look, I'm going to say this because if you're religious or not, look, when you forgive yourself, God forgives you. When God forgives you, it's the greatest forgiveness of all. Mm -hmm. Why do we sit and beat ourselves up over the same thing over and over again? Why do we take years to strip ourselves down, to rip ourselves down? Yes. To look at ourselves and say, I am not good enough. I have already been forgiven. I've already paid the price of it. Absolutely. I've already done what I was asked to do. Those of you who believe in God, great. God forgave you. You asked mm -hmm. for forgiveness. You all received that. You all know how to, uh, how to receive that. So why do we continue to carry the dead horse? Why do we add on to the dead horse? It's not like, yes. oh, I, I forgive myself for this. I can't. Oh, but there was this other thing. And we keep stacking dead horses on. Absolutely. Like, why? And it's, it's the hardest person you will ever have to forgive is yourself. And a lot of people don't even think that they should forgive themselves or even think about doing it. And when I, when I point it out to the individuals that I speak to, I'm like, have you forgiven yourself for what you did? 
They were like, you know what? No. That's why you're stuck. You're stuck because you haven't forgiven yourself. I was stuck, so I know I can say that. <laughs> Speaking from experience. How? Take us through how did you get unstuck? How did you forgive yourself? And it's more than just, you know, I just said enough's enough. But how did you get to that process? Because it is a beat up, right? It is depression that kicks mm -hmm. in. And then you 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 self you yeah. self loathe. You, you don't even self soothe. You just are in a space where you you can't get out. You feel like you have put yourself in this box you've created for yourself. You can't get out. So to name, please tell us how. Give us one or two steps that you said. This is what I did, and this is how I was able to get out. I wrote down everything that I was beating myself up for. That was the first step. I wrote down everything I was beating myself up. For. So I was beating myself up for not finishing college. I was beating myself up for ending up in prison, not being able to get a good job, being a felon. Like it was a lot of things that I was beating myself up for. I thought I should be so much further along than I was. And that was my biggest thing. Like if you hadn't done this, then you would have you would be here. That was, it was it was that if you had not, then you would have been. And I said, but I did it. Now what? I can't go back and take it back. I did it. So all I can do is move on from that. So I had to accept what I had done. I had to take ownership of that. Then forgive myself. Because if I couldn't take ownership of the dumb stuff that I did, then how could I forgive myself for the dumb stuff I did? Hmm. Could I, I'm going to ask this question. When you were writing out all the things all those dumb things, all the things that you were holding back. Did you weep? Oh, Did absolutely. You not, not just like weep when you see a love sappy movie. I'm talking about real deep emotional weeping. I'm, I'm about to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I was releasing. It was a release. So when... Right, <laughs> writing all of that stuff out was me releasing myself from bondage of each and everything that I was writing. So those things no longer uh, had me in handcuffs. So I was getting freer and freer and freer with each and everything that I wrote down. <laughs> Guys, uh, listen, listen. If you've never, if you haven't yet forgiven yourself, it's time, it's time to stop. Mm -hmm. Stop beating yourself up. Stop thinking, man, I, if I would have just done this, I would have been the super athlete. If I would have just done this, I would have been a better person. Mm -hmm. Write the crap down and get it out of your head. Purge. Yes. Because what you're doing is, Tanane is telling us, she is now giving her permission. She's giving herself permission to become the version we see today, to be this individual that God needs her to be, that the universe needs her to be. However you guys, well, I'm going to say God, because that's where we're both, you know, both faith Christians, right? Mm -hmm. You, God needed you to forgive you. He had already done that eight years ago, 10 years ago. He was just waiting for you to say enough's enough. I'm done. I'm writing this all up. Deep, deep crying. Guys, I know it's tough. Look, we're, we're big macho, bang on our chest. I'm not going to cry. Bull crap. Crying does two things. One, it releases. Mm -hmm. And two, it gives clarity. It's a healing thing. Mm. Crying is healing. And people think it's weakness. No, 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 no. It's at, just like you said. It's purging. It's a healing process. And you feel so much better when you finish. So much, and I and I preach all the time. Feel your feelings. Everything you think you need to feel, feel it. Because if you do not feel it, those feelings are going to surface later down the road. They always do. Mm. Oh man! Wow. We we could stop. We could stop at this principle right there, but we won't because I got more to get through. We're going to extrapolate everything you've got, and you've got a lot, guys. This is. I told you this was going to be a banger. I told you. Oh, man. All right. Let me ask you this question. 
greater forgiveness. Take us, take us, I, I'm curious, I, I, I want to know, take us a little bit about through your life as you were growing up, right? Mm -hmm. now, that, now that just everybody knows, holy crap, we see who you are now. Where did you come from? Where did this Jacksonville, Florida girl, how did we get to this point? Everybody know we had a conversation before this. So a lot of the questions I'm going to ask, I've, I've gained permission to ask. But tell, take us through that relationship you had with your mom, your, your dad first, and then your mom. What is that? What was that relationship like as you were growing up? So my dad, I'm a, I'm a daddy's girl through and through, like wholeheartedly. Him and I have the same exact face. You, when you saw him, you saw me. I was always on his hip somewhere, anywhere. My daddy went, I went. And my father was the nurturer. He was the super provider. He's a 39 and a half year uh, Army National Guard vet, federal civil service. Really easy, really laid back um, and just a caring man. He He's one of the best men I know. And my dad showed me what strength was, but he also showed me what love looked like. Mm. And, you know, most people say they get that, that nurturing and everything from their mom. My mom wasn't that for me and my, my sister, neither, you know, um, I have one sister. She wasn't that person for us. My dad was that person. When I was nine years old, my mom left and left us with my dad for a spell. But she, she eventually came back. And the way I describe it is that one day she was gone and then one day she was back. She didn't tell us that she was leaving and she didn't tell us that she was coming back. <laughs> so, and, and later down, I, I didn't know how long she was gone for. And I think she said it was only like six months, but as a child, you think it's forever. Mm -hmm. And because she did leave, I, I had a sense of some abandonment issues in regards to my mom. Um, but she came back like when I was 10 or 11 years old. And then two years later, my dad left. But he let us know he was leaving. Mm -hmm. And he talked to us. And he let us know what was going on. And so I didn't have a disconnect with my father when that happened. My mom, after my dad left, uh, my mom, she she was just, just like a ghost. You knew she was there, but you couldn't see her. Mm -hmm. And my sister is 18 months older than I. She was in every activity at a drama school, at an art school. So I never saw her. So it was just like me in the house. And then this ghost. And when I went and got in high school, my sister had gone to college and my mom and I, we were roommates. That's literally all we were, except I didn't pay bills. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we were roommates. We would see each other in passing. I might not see my mom for a week or so. I would get up and go to school in the morning come home at midnight every night on Friday. I get up and go to school that Friday and just come back Sunday at midnight. That's what I would do. I gave myself my own curfew. I was like, okay, I'll be in the house by midnight. Mm -hmm. It. She, she was, I felt like she was too busy living her own life to be concerned about mine. Mm. So I, I raised myself. I had to set my own goals. I had to care about my grades uh, and I was pretty good. I had to care about my grades. I had to care about my academics, what I wanted to do. And she didn't put anything in me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say what I learned from my mom. I learned patience from my mom. <laughs> But years, years later, you know, in, in my age now, over the last few years, I had to learn to give my mom some grace and some mercy because she had never been a mother to me and my sister and we had never been her children. So I had to learn 
that she was learning as we were learning. And she didn't know what she was doing. And she was fighting her own demons at the time of trying to raise us. And uh, we're, I'll, I'll do anything for my mom. I always would, and, but there's still some like, eh, tell you like, eh, I remember her. <laughs> But in the same spell, you know, she's still my mom. I'll do anything for her. We just don't have the relationship. And I used to say we don't have the relationship that I thought a mother and daughter should have. But we have the relationship that we were supposed to have. Because everything is already written. Like, without her being my mother, I wouldn't be who I am. And I'm very appreciative that she did the best she could with what she had. Mm. Mm-mm. You parents out there, hope you listen to that. You kids out there, hope you listen to that. Let me ask, before I ask uh, like five other questions, I need to ask this question real quick. During the part when you were writing out all the things that you were mad at yourself for, right? Things you wouldn't forgive yourself for. Your mom ever come up in those as you were writing that down? No, because it wasn't about her. It was about me. At what point, and, that's a, and the reason I ask that because there's a big distinguishing, right? It's mm-hmm. a big, you have to distinguish. When you write those things out, it's about you. It's not about the victim. It's not about, well, because of this person, I am where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Listen to what she just said. She could have played the victim card easily. You had multiple cards you could have played. Yeah. But you hold yourself accountable for what happened to you and the choices that you made. Mm-hmm. At what point, at what point, one, did you, did you, forgive your mom and two what did that release when you finally were able to just be like i'm I'm, i can't do this i gotta i have to forgive you i don't forget but i have to forgive you so i can progress Mm -hmm. to be the person we see today yeah because i couldn't keep beating her up either Mm. so when i um i started counseling in 2021 january 2021 and my therapist and I, we dug deep and we took out all the, the clothes out of the drawers, <laughs> out of the closet. We took everything out and started putting the pieces that mattered back into these drawers and these closets. And what I realized is that I'm 42 years old. My mom was 20 some odd years old, early 20s when she had my sister and I. If I was 20 something years old with a kid, how would I have have raised my children? You know, she Mm -hmm. had just begun to live her life. She got, her and my dad got married young, but she had just begun to live her life and she got married, not for herself, but for her grandparents. Mm. And she had kids, not for herself, but for my father. So I couldn't fault her for doing what she thought she had to do or needed to do. So forgiving my mom was easier than forgiving myself. Because like I said, grace and mercy and trying to understand my mom as a 22 year old mom. Mm -hmm. And then looking at myself as a 22 year old person. Man, it's deep. Man, that is, guys, just, just, just conceptualize that for a second. Just take that in for a second. There were so many things that, no, look, I'm not saying that Tanae went her entire life and didn't blame her mom for something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she probably did. Of course she did. Let's not, let's not be stupid about it, but let's, let's bring it, let's bring it in to school. When it came down to it, Tanae said, I'm going to take responsibility for all the decisions that I made because they were my decisions. Absolutely. When it comes time, I will forgive my mom. That was the easiest thing to do, was mm-hmm. forgive my mom. Even though I didn't know her as a kid. She was in and out of my life. We were we were roommates growing up. I was mm-hmm. the one to set my own curfew, my own grades. I, was, I had my own list of things that I could and couldn't do and when, I, when I had needed a mother or a parent to do this. Come on. Come on. The victim mentality in today's society, because I because of this, yes. I am where I am. It's the it's the rich dad, poor dad. 
yes. mentality, right? Really? Come on. Let's, let's, and I'm, look, I, I'm probably coming off a little brash and a little hard. I'm probably going to get a ton of messages from people. I, you don't know my life. You're right. I don't know your life. I don't know Tanae's life, but what I do know is where we see today, where she is today is the byproduct or the product of her saying enough is enough, no more, no more victim mentality, get my butt into counseling. We're going to strip everything out of the drawer and I will allow certain things in and I won't allow certain things in. This is my drawer of my life and I am going, and look, it is difficult. It is difficult to admit when we're at fault or we're wrong. We hate, as a human being, we hate when we're wrong. 100%. Absolutely. And the thing is, in those drawers, I wasn't the only one putting stuff in them. I was allowing other people to put stuff in my drawers. But when I took ownership of my drawer, which is my life, mm. then I was able to take what other people had put in, that, that negative talk, you can't do this, you'll never be this. And I had to take that out of my drawers. And just allow what I believed inside, inside my life. There you go. Now, look, I'm, I, I have to say this, ladies, ladies, yes, moms, women, I, I understand it probably at this point, look, well, he's bagging on the moms. Where, where's dad at the entire time? We're getting to that. I promise. In fact, right now we're getting to it. What happened? Dad's been going, you know, dad leaves 12 years old, 14, right? It kind of just. 13. But he sat down at 13, talked mm -hmm. about why he was leaving. Mm -hmm. well, being such a daddy's girl, I love to think that I'm a daddy's girl with all my girls, right? What was that like, though? What was that transition? What was that that break, that separation like when well, he's gone? I, I was still with him. Like, I would, we had a key to his house, my sister and I. So we would go over there every other weekend, every weekend, because he wanted to be with us. It was like he never not wanted to spend time with his children. Um, he was very present. He got remarried and that changed. Um, and he, he, he lived for his wife and her daughter. Um, and like they would go on trips and we wouldn't be, in, he would never invite us, you know, stuff like that. But he still did everything he possibly could for my sister and I. He just had to hide it from his wife. Mm. And I brought it to his attention uh, a couple years ago. But in, it's been about six or seven years ago, he was diagnosed with angititis of the central nervous system and he forgot everybody like he didn't know my name and he was hallucinating and they did not know what was wrong with him until they did a brain biopsy and when they found out what was wrong they put him on steroids and he came back and when he came back we went to lunch you no know, we went to breakfast at Cracker Barrel like once a month and we um, were able to learn each other again and bond again. And over the last year, oh, I'm not gonna cry. Over the last year or two, he, uh, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he turned 67, he's young. He turned 67, December 29th. And I called him to tell him happy birthday. And of course he didn't know it was his birthday or how old he was, but he gives me like signs that he wants to remember. And uh, yeah, so I just, I just remember my dad being Superman to me. Mm -hmm. And I know people like, well, he did this and he did that and you're, you know, you were, you were still a daddy's girl. That's because from the age of zero to 13, he was there completely and fully. And he nurtured me and he loved me. Um, well, shoot from zero to 16 when he got remarried, he loved me and he nurtured me and I could talk to him. 
And I couldn't do that with my mom and she didn't give me that. So was it easier to forgive my dad for his absence when he was absent? Yes, because he was so present when I was when I was a kid. You know, he became absent when I was a teenager or so. I still saw him, still talk to him, you know, free, weekly, if not daily. But um, yeah, so I, I, I did have to forgive both my parents in my lifetime for certain situations. And I did have to give them grace and mercy in certain situations as well. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> just, just sit and think about this. She's lived more lives than most most anybody will. A lot of people. Oh, get life. Yeah, you fish. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> Come on, guys. Just, I mean, we there is. Look, look, she's a coach. Okay, Let, give a little bit, a little bit of back. I mean, a little bit of back history, right? She's she's a coach. She's a mentor. She's a TEDx speaker. She's an advocate. For prison reform, I mean, she she wrote the book. Guys, look, you can get it. I'll have the link in there, right? From prison to president. She is massive. Like this movement she is creating, this 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 person that we see now in front of us. But you guys, if, you, if you're you listening, to it, great. Go to YouTube and just go back and listen to that last little bit of her going into it. What we see is somebody who is now in a space where she has forgiven. She's saying life is too precious. You don't think life is too precious? Having a dad, having a dad have first stages Alzheimer's, that's gotta be rough. I don't care who it is. You have a parent and now they can barely remember your name. They don't know who you are, your birthday, come on. And then she didn't say this, but I'm gonna tell you this because she told me this earlier or before we talked. She put her mom, and she can't forget her mom and she put her mom into counseling. Gave her mom help. She didn't need to, but because she forgave herself. Tanane forgave herself, allowed herself to grow. She knew she had to do something that she probably was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I really want to. Maybe. I don't know. I'm only just guesstimizing. But to put your, put your mom in a place mm -hmm. to get help? Come on. And I'll say this, mom, since my mom has been in counseling, she's been so much better. And it's it's weird because my mom was never emotionally available or like that affectionate mom or anything like that. And now I, I saw my mom tear up at who I've become. Mm. And I was like, oh, you all right? <laughs> but to... For her to get in touch with um, who she is and for her to forgive herself for certain things that she's done to herself in her life is, is, a, is a beautiful thing to see. And I'm super proud of her. And I, I support her 125%. And yeah, it was getting her in counseling. I was like, I need to talk to someone. And finally, last year, it kind of clicked for her. And uh, yeah, we got that going. And she's she's such in a better place. And she's happier. Doesn't drink as much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's, she's lost weight. It's just like to see a healthy version of that lady makes me happy. And I'm sure it makes her, her partner happy as well. Ah. Did you guys hear that? No. Did you hear that? Not the way, not what she was saying, but the tone in which she was saying it. She relived two parts of her life. The part where she was this stranger passing in the night. You heard her voice. This quiet kind of, yeah, I can still recall those hurt feelings. And now the voice of, yeah, look at her. Cry, like, who are you crying? That is true and pure forgiveness. That is you saying, I forgive what you do. I forgive what you did. I see that you're trying to help. Sometimes heroes don't wear capes. I love, I've always loved that saying. Sometimes it takes people to go through experiences 
to have those experiences go through you, like our, my buddy uh, Pascal Bachman said, go through you, that you can inspire other people to want to change. Absolutely. It, it may not happen all the time, but wow. Like if I wasn't in counseling and, and my mom didn't see the change just that I was making in, you know, the changes in me, then she may not have been willing to do the same thing. And for her, like, okay, well, maybe it's helping her. So let me try. And her willingness to do it and now to do the work to get uh, emotionally healthy and mentally healthy is changing her whole her whole life in a sense. Mm. I have a couple more questions on that, but I'm going to skip that <clears throat> only because we have we we have what we've witnessed really is a transformation of of spirit of transformation of God working through you to touch multiple people people you don't even know people coming out of prison we'll get into that in a second becoming an advocate and a voice you thought it was for people in prison and people you didn't know but you became an advocate and a voice for your mom and for your dad you became this advocate for them where they needed help they needed to reach out whether they wanted to admit it or not they needed it and you were there because you said enough is enough with me now I inspire them gosh dang it that is so good yeah absolutely oh, man. <laughs> the, the beauty of this is i get to go back and, and listen to this multiple times before this before this comes out and just the nuggets oh all right all right let me ask this question i, I want to read this this is coming out of your chapter seven uh, bullet point number two, talking about self-care. Okay. Quote, there was a time when society considered self-care selfish. However, self-care has become less of an option and more of a necessity since the pandemic. More people are stressed out, stressed about tomorrow than ever before. Therefore, it is important to take a step back, unplug and unwind. How, how can we care for others if we aren't taking taking the time to care for ourselves please 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 take us through this process because obviously you you work with so many people mm -hmm. and you were you were you're drawing from experiences obviously your TEDx talk you're coaching you're mentoring you've lived more lives than most people so help us understand what you are seeing and how we can make this paradigm of shift in our in society on an airplane what do they tell you to do when a mask drops put yours on first and mm -hmm. then your child because if you try to put them theirs on first and something happens to you and you can't breathe you can't help them so you have to give yourself oxygen so you can give others oxygen so i literally once a quarter put up my laptop my phone and for like three or four days and take a vacation because I have to recharge because I give so much and I, I, I want to give to everybody and I know I can't do that. So I have to limit uh, the amount of people that I take on. Like you said, I, I coach and I mentor. I did not set out to do any of that. <laughs> not my goal. My I, I didn't set out to do a tent. TEDx, I didn't set out to, to write a book. I didn't, that that wasn't what I, I thought I would be doing. Mm -hmm. But my story resonated with so many people that I was like, you know what? I'll tell it. So self-care and it's, and people, some people don't realize that self-care is also about caring for others because helping other people makes you feel good. Say that again. Say that again because got, people like me are a little slow. We have a hard time. Of, say that point you just made one more time, please. Helping others is a sense of self-care because when we help others, it makes us feel good. It releases those pheromones that gives us a joy within ourselves and makes us more apt to. And, and, and this is the thing. When we exchange that positive energy to someone else, 
what are they going to do? Take it to someone else. So, you know, they say one person can change the world. And it's true because the energy that you give off can bounce on multiple people. So me going and feeding the homeless makes me feel good. That's that's taking care of myself. It's self-care. Just as much as me going to get a manicure and a pedicure. Hmm. Just as much as me going on vacation and unplugging. So with self-care, there's so many different forms of it. And you can pick and choose which one best suits you. And if helping others is at the top of your list, then so be it. But you also have to help yourself in the process. <laughs> Dang it. Oh, this is so freaking. <laughs> I remember multiple times I just want to scream as loud as I can. Like run out, literally run out. That is just, I got to ask this question then. Give us. Give all of us mm-hmm. two principles. How can we, you, you, you unplug for, you know, four days. Most people are like, I can't do that, right? You mm-hmm. just, in the season of where you are in your life, you're able to do that. Yes. But give us, give us one or two principles on how we can unplug, how we can start to develop self-care. In the morning, don't pick up your phone. <laughs> like, you know, most people, they work off their phone, internet. When you wake up and open your eyes, don't allow your phone to be the first thing you reach for. And if you reach for your phone, put on a four-minute song and listen to that four-minute song and take deep breaths before you get your day started. Before you start FaceTime, before you start screen time, give yourself five, 10 minutes. I promise it won't hurt you. That's that's one thing that especially when I'm working a lot, I try to make sure at night after nine o'clock, I put my phone down. I don't look at it before I go to bed. And in the morning, I don't look. That's not the first thing I, I look at when I wake up. Also, driving. Take a drive. I don't care if you have to get up at night and just drive 30 minutes and just think. Be with you. Be with yourself. And a lot of people don't like themselves. They have to get to know themselves in order to be with themselves and like themselves. I didn't like myself. So I had I surrounded myself with people um, that made me feel good. Now I can make me feel good because I like myself. Because I forgave myself. It all goes back to that. Take take a good drive and don't pick up your phone first thing in the morning. Man, that's, you know, talking with a lot of my mentors, that's what a lot of them say. You have to allow yourself to embrace the morning, embrace what it is. Because if you grab your phone, the first thing you're going to do is go to social media. The first you're gonna, the first thing you're gonna do is look at what other people and how they're so happy and so jubilee and so blah. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, how are they waking up? And they look absolutely phenomenal. And I'm waking up, I look at, at like absolute trash. Filter. Hey, <laughs> it's a filter. Come on. It's like if I live, so if I'm on Mountain or Pacific time, and I look at somebody who lives in Eastern time, they've been up for one hour or two. Mm -hmm. they've already gotten through they've already gone through their morning routines it's developing what she's saying is you develop a routine that routine cannot start with you looking at your phone it can't because you're instantly going to see where you're failing your mind tricks you and say oh we're we're still in bed they've already ran a freaking the boston marathon they've already ran 22 miles (laughs) yes You you have you have got to absolutely uh, get a routine going and stick to it. You know what they, what do they say? Twenty one days consistent is a habit forming. Mm-hmm. So if you do it for twenty one days consistently, now it's a habit. Yep. And you had add to that. Twenty one days is consistent. You now have a good habit. It takes thirty days to keep it consistent. Guys, it only takes five days to develop a crappy habit. Mm-hmm. Five. My gosh. We, we, <clears throat> we're going to start a movement. This is going to start a movement. This, this <laughs> episode is going to start an absolute 
craze for people. If you can, it's self love, self care, forgive. Let's let's become better. Allow your allow God to allow you become better, please. I mean, this is in 2019, June of 2019. I lost everything. I tell that story in my TEDx. I lost everything. And then I didn't allow myself to feel those feelings of loss. And then a year later is when those feelings surfaced and I was broken. I was in the darkest place, the darkest time of my life. And from those dark times stemmed my journey to forgiveness because I didn't want to stay in that place. I was so depressed and so broken and I was drinking beer for breakfast and lunch. And I don't even drink beer. But that's, it was like, that's what was there. And I woke up and I said, I can't, I can't live like this. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I decided to start counseling and try to figure out why I was in the place that I was in. And I'm, I'm an advocate for therapy. I'm an advocate for uh, mm -hmm. counseling. My, um, my therapist, her name is Alexandra. That is like she tried, she was like, you're doing the work we can go to, you know, once a month. I was like, no, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, we will not be a codependent relationship. I said, yes, it will. But she has <laughs> helped me through so much. And she has absolutely allowed me to unpack. And I, I am so grateful for being a whole healed person today. It was therapy. Mm. Man. This this is this is going to be one I'm telling you right now. Everybody, the eight continents that were eight, eight countries that we're in, that continent, there's only seven of them. Well, come on. The eight countries that we're in, they all everybody can res resonate with this. This self-care, self, this forgiveness, this mindset, this this shifting of the paradigm of shift. Un freaking believable. Unbelievable. All right, let's come to the sad part of this conversation. But before we go, tell us about your work. Now, look, I've told you all through this course of this conversation what she does and where she goes. She speaks to a lot of people. She helps a lot of people. But if we want to reach out, we want to get connected with you, tell us how we can find you, your social media links, what's the best way to connect with you? All right, so the best way to connect with me is on my website, tanainejenkins.com. I do travel and I speak. I'm actually uh, going to be on the East Coast for the majority of the beginning of the years. East Coast, West Coast. Yeah, no, the West Coast. Where? What coast am I on? The West Coast. You're in the East. I'm on the East. You're in Florida, right? Yeah, You're I failed geography, I promise. <laughs> so on the East Coast um, for, for the most of the beginning of the year, that's Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, New York, Oh, I'll be in Illinois. Yeah, so my schedule is on my website, tenangigas.com. You can also, go. I am Googleable. Um, so you can Google me and see what I'm doing, where I'm going to be. But the best way, tenangigas.com. If you want to purchase the book that Cameron was so graciously showing, that is also on my website. I do one workshops. I have one this coming Sunday. Uh, you can register on the website. And if you want any one-on-one, -on -one, if you're a returning citizen, justice-involved individual, or someone who has been through something and has a story that they want to turn into a message, I have From Prison to President, the blueprint where I teach individuals how to use their voice to make the changes that they want to see in this world. I'm, uh, somehow I got to figure out how to get this signed because it's going to be, you know, one of those blockbuster. Oh, man. New it's York, not signed. New York, you know, New York Times bestseller 101. But I can't wait for her next book. I'm already saying that. 2024, she's going to come out with a new book. Yeah, it won't be a workbook. It'll actually be the actual Done. story. Done. Of, uh, everything. I cannot wait for it. All right. I can't wait either. <laughs> All right. Before I let you go, I ask you this question. As we wrap up this just phenomenal interview, let me ask you, if you were to see your five-year-old self today, what do you think she would say to you? 
she would say, well, damn, you became bigger than I ever thought you could be. That's what she would say. She, she would say, so, so you wrote a book, so, so you're a poet, so you changed lives, huh? And I would say, absolutely do. It would, that would be a really cool conversation to have with my five-year-old self. Because, mm. <clears throat> yeah. Cool conversation. But yeah, she would, she would say, so you're bigger than we ever thought you could be. Mm. Guys, I had to look off to the side. I had to watch her say that. I love asking that question and watch their expressions. Oh, man, this is so good. All right, five books. I need five books you would recommend. Oh, this one, of course, we'll, don't worry. We'll, that, that, that is one of the books we'll recommend. I'll, the link will be, give me five books you'd recommend anybody to read, whether it's personal development, spiritual, mental, emotional, uh, business related, just five books that you would say must read. All right. So <laughs> I like, I love, uh, so I love books, right? So the, one of the best books that I've read last year was the year of yes by Shonda Rhimes. And it was her saying yes to every, she made a decision that she would say yes to everything in for one year to see how it played out. And if you don't know who Shonda Rhimes is, she's the uh, writer of Scandal, Grey's Anatomy. Um, she was like themed Friday, uh, was it Thursday night? Shonda, Shonda Land. So she did wrote the year of yes and it changed her life just by saying yes, because they said you always say no. <laughs> so the year of yes. And I, so I like a little comedy because you, you have to, laugh in this life mm -hmm. so chelsea handler is one of my go-tos and her book are you there vodka is me chelsea is hilarious <laughs> uh eat eat pray love it's also a favorite and it takes you on a journey uh spiritual emotional mental and physical journey of the mind so that one was a really good book what I know for sure by none other than Oprah Winfrey made me try to figure out what I knew for sure. And so those are, I think those are my five books, including my own. Ah, fantastic. I used to love when, when her and Joe Coy were dating, Chelsea Handler and Joe Coy, mm -hmm. when they were dating, it was fun watching their little interaction between the two. Was, you're right. Yeah. She is, she, she is a firecracker. Guys. You can see why this is this is one of the fastest growing shows. I mean, last year ranked in the top 25% of the most shared globally. And you can see why, because we bring people on like to name that just tell us, never give up, never quit, forgive yourself, and become the best versions of yourself. This has been an absolute banger, a treat. I am honored and privileged to bring and on. I cannot wait and watch her growth. It is going to be absolutely fantastic. Oh, man, I another this show. Nah, I believe this show does so well because of you, Cameron. You oh. you are the one that gets us together and asks the, the tough questions and asks the questions that people want to know the answers to. So kudos to you for having one of the best shows in the, in, what is this, the nation, the world right now? <laughs> Well, congratulations to you on that, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, like, share, comment below. Go give us a – if you haven't yet, go give us a rating on all those all the streaming services. We'd love to hear all your comments and your, and your questions. This has been another fantastic episode of The Art Study of You. We'll catch you on the next episode. Have a great day.